Welcome everyone to the session on personalized therapy in children. This, this is really an, an open forum where we are hoping to discuss something that is, that is very new, that we think is very important for the NHS in the 21st century, that is already happening in certain areas, particularly cancer, and it's not happening in the field of in the field of pediatric asthma, in the field of children's asthma and allergy and eczema. So it's a huge area of children's diseases, children's illness, and it is not happening in this particular area. And we are, we as a group, I think we have been working on trying to think of ways in which could, in which, by which we could bring in personalized medicine into these areas, but I think early steps, important promise, and some of this we will talk about today. So the format that, that we have is, is that we are going to have a few short presentations by people who I think have, have a stake in this particular area in various ways. Before I start though, I must let you all know that the event is being filmed. So if you have any objections to being filmed yourselves, please could you let James know and, and he'll make sure that you don't get filmed for this particular event. That's all right with everyone. Thank you. It, it is important to get the film, <coughs> get, get this filmed because this is, this is actually quite important. This particular discussion that we are having is very, very important and I would really want you to engage with what we are discussing today. We've got a wonderful group of people here. And, you know, this is, this, is, this is the first time we are discussing personalized medicine in the field of children's asthma and allergy and eczema. Probably the first time anywhere in the world. I could be wrong. But, but I cannot imagine we have had a lot of discussions in this area anywhere in the world. I, I can tell you we are going to be discussing this many, many times over the next 10 to 20 years. So in a way, what we are doing today as a small group, as an interested group, is kind of heartbreaking. I think we have to all accept this. So we, I don't know how much you know about personalized medicine. I would like to believe that you probably don't know very much about it, some of you at any way. So, I'm just going to start off with a slide to talk about a child. And in a very generic way, I'm going to ask you a question, which is here at the bottom. So I can read it out if you like. Lucy is a seven-year-old girl who has asthma and eczema. Her father has asthma and her brother has severe eczema, severe asthma, sorry, and hay fever and multiple food allergies. She takes different medicines to help her with her asthma and eczema. Lucy finds her eczema can make it hard to sleep at night. Her asthma can make it difficult to keep up when she plays sports with her friends. Could a personalized approach to management help improve Lucy's quality of life? And please answer just as you please, because we are of course going to be talking about personalized medicine for the next hour. So please put your hands up if you think the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, some of you have said yes, which is, which is, which is great. Which is great. Let me, if I may, talk for a few minutes on the kind of work we have been doing in this field. We have published a, a, a fairly broad range of papers, and I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to bore you with the science of all those papers at all. But I will, I will talk briefly about two important discoveries that are likely to make an impact in this field. One is the discovery of a gene defect in a protein called filaggrin. And what filaggrin does is it acts as a staple and it holds together the keratin filaments that lie on our skin. So we've all got skin which prevents the entry of substances into our body, substances like allergens, it could be bacteria, it could be all kinds of different 
different agents that are coming and invading our body. And the keratin is being held together by the filaggrin, by the tight, efficiently working filaggrin molecules. The sheets are nicely lined up. The skin is relatively impermeable. The skin is not letting things in. In about 15%, 15% is quite a large proportion, 15% of people in the United Kingdom and similarly across the world, the filaggrin doesn't work well. And the allergens can come in through the barriers. So you have got these two pictures that I've got, a, I've got a pointer, which I will use. This is healthy skin. Healthy meaning this is skin that has got intact filaggrin. This is skin in children, in that 15, 15 or so percent of children who have got defective filaggrin. And in these children, allergens can come in. And if these allergens are coming in, imagine a little baby at the time of birth born with this defective skin, the allergens will continue to come in right from the moment he or she essentially comes out and definitely when he or she goes home from the labor ward and there's a cat at home, there is dust, there is, there is um, pollution around the child in the, in the taxi on the way home. So literally from the from the first day of life, the child is being hit by, by, these, by these allergens and these toxins. So if you have permeable skin because of this defect, you could have lots of, lots of foreign substances coming into your system. And we find that these children get sensitized to allergens, they have a worse course of asthma, they have got a worse course of eczema, they have got many more problems with these diseases throughout their life. So here is the birth of personalized medicine in our field. You've got two groups of children, you've got a vulnerable subgroup, and you can actually treat this problem right from birth. How? Well, we know that if you apply something really simple called uh, something that improves skin barrier, emollients, which all of you, all of us use, you know, simple creams, e E45 cream and so on, it improves the skin barrier. So immediately you could argue that these discoveries point towards, towards the, the question, can we improve the skin barrier? Can we reduce the risk of allergies and asthma and so on in this child. And from my point of view as a doctor, I find that there are two approaches, two ways in which the world is looking at this. So we doctors are, 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 fairly, are fairly rigid in the way we think about some of these things. And we would say, or some of us would say, that, oh, you need to have a, a proper randomized <coughs> controlled trial to prove that a cream such as this actually makes a difference to the child's life over a five or six year time scale before you can say to the mother, okay, go ahead and start using creams from the age of five months or five weeks or even five days or perhaps even five hours, as I said, almost from the time of birth. It'll be interesting to know what people think about this. If, if we gave you this information, would you say, yes, that is right? Or would you say, excuse me, I want to have that information and I want to make a choice. I want to decide whether or not I should be using these, this simple management strategy, the use of emollients with, with my baby right from the time of birth if, it, if there is a good chance that this is going to reduce my child going down that allergic march pathway. It's your choice, and, and the first step is to be able to inform you about these discoveries. And this, this gap remains, and that's why we need meetings such as this, to be able to transcend, to be able to cover that gap, to be able to give you that information, to be able to get your views. Does, does this make sense to people? Excellent. Let's just talk about one other scenario, and then we will move on to to other interesting aspects of this question. Let's just look at another area of work that we have been 
spending some time on. This is, this is something not to do with the philagrin story, but this is to do with the medicines that we use for asthma. So when you give a child, or, or a grown-up for that matter, when you give a patient a medicine to treat any particular disease, let's just concentrate on asthma for the moment, what happens is that the medicine, and some of those typical medicines are up there, pictures of the blue inhaler, the serotide, the Montelukast inhaler, the medicine goes and binds with a molecule inside, a, a protein molecule inside our lungs, if it's the lung disease that we are trying to treat, or wherever else, and it binds, and when it, when it fits in, like a key fits into a lock, it leads to an effect, leads to release of chemicals, and in the case of a good medicine, it makes us feel better. But the snag is that every child is different. We are all made differently, and we've got our own slight genetic variations which can affect the way our body proteins are being made. So some of those receptor molecules in our body can be made differently. And one of the important molecules, one of the really important medicine molecules that we use for the treatment of asthma is, is known as the beta-2 agonist. It's, it's contained in these two common medicines, the salbutamol, which is the reliever, serotide, which is a controller. And what happens is, is that about 20% of us have got a receptor that is not groove, 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 spike, groove, spike, groove, spike, as you can see. Talking simplistically, it's, it's built differently. So the key, the medicine molecule, does not fit the lock. The medicine doesn't work. What happens then? Well, imagine a little child who is wheezing. He's got a tight chest. And the doctor is saying, you must take this medicine. The doctor is saying this to the child every day from the age of one or two or three to, to the mum initially and then to the child. But the medicine isn't working. How does that affect the child? Does it, does it make a small difference to the child? Does it make an enormous difference to the child? I don't think there is a lot of dispute around this. It does make a very big difference to the child, does it not? So, so again, here is another area of personalization. One of, one of the questions that we, we can begin to discuss is, like the story that we discussed before for filagrin, like the story that we are discussing here today for our beta-2 receptor medicine, is there a need to consider genotyping these children? to actually look at their genetic <coughs> status with the help of tests. These tests are not currently done within the NHS. But what does the public think? Should we be doing these tests in order to find out the children who are vulnerable, in order to be able to give them the right medicine? Or is it OK to treat them generically, like we do right now? Give them all the same medicine. If the medicine doesn't work, we add on a further layer of medicine. That's the usual way we treat patients. And then we add on a further layer, and so on. So we are doing things well. We are treating patients. They are getting better. But it's the, the question that I think we are trying to talk about today is whether a more personalized, a more one-size-fits-one rather than a one-size-fits-all approach will improve our management and what does the public think about it? Is there a need to try to persuade the NHS, persuade the government, persuade our GPs to move in that direction? I shall stop here. We are going to now have some very, very interesting perspectives on this. There's Stuart here and Stuart's background is in the area of art, in the area of communication, in terms of bringing, you can, you can tell us more about this, Stuart, because I will probably not be able to represent your case very well at all. But Stuart, if I may say this with your permission, Stuart has personal experience of 
asthma, allergy, eczema. And Stuart is also working at the interface of, of, of human interaction, of interacting with people who have got, who have got major problems with complex disease and how they bring their, their views out into the public. Stuart, Stuart, I'm sure, will be able to explain this a, lot, a million times better than I do. And we've got Emma, who is also a very, very valuable part of this panel. And Emma has had, again, she has a very personal insight, I'm not going to say anything more, of asthma and allergy and how individualized management can perhaps make a difference to, to something that is very real and true and important in Emma's life. And, and how Emma has taken this experience forward into trying to help the community, help the world in general. And we have a third panelist who is here, but she's not here. We've been trying really, really hard to contact Minu Singh, professor of pediatric respiratory medicine at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, India. But we have not succeeded in getting the Skype link. So we, we might have another go later, maybe. I, I don't know if you can. We know Minu is sitting there because we can see her face, but <laughs> we haven't been able to talk to her. However, Minu has recorded, uh, just kind of anticipating this problem, uh, a five minute conversation which we will play so that we can bring the, the, the international perspective into this discussion. Because one important question is, is personalized medicine only for the rich countries or is it important for everyone? And this is a very, very important. Does the mother of the child living <coughs> under the railway bridge in Delhi, in that, in that slum, have, have, some, have something to say about this? Does, does she want personalized med medical care for her child? Or, or is, is, is she, she not good enough to be included in this discussion? This, this is an element that, this is an angle that I think we should all bring in right from the beginning. Because we know from history that the, the developing world, the world has been excluded from, from the cutting edge progress in medical science. We know from the 20th century that this has happened. We don't want that to happen in the 21st century. Thank you very much. I shall hand you over to Stuart and then to Emma after. Thank so you. Please. Thank you, Professor. Um, as the Professor said, um, my name is Stuart Drew and I'm a topic. Um, I have eczema, asthma and allergies predominantly from birth. Um, I have a brother who is nine years older than me and who is predominantly asthmatic or was asthmatic. Um, and what's really interesting about him is I really, uh, I really remember the introduction of the steroid inhalers um, when he was small and how that was treated. So if you like a little bit of a period without those drugs and then the introduction of those drugs through my relationship with him. Um, I also have a sister that's 12 years older than me and that suffers really badly from psoriasis and has done a complete life and still does. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood in Great Ormond Street, um, some of which was kind of wrapped in wet dressings um, for periods of two weeks at a time. Um, the care at Great Ormond Street at that time was really excellent. And actually it's really interesting that what Sommath is talking about seems very natural to me. I guess there's, I'm now 46 years old, born in the 70s, in 71. And so I guess that kind of wealth of experience, as I say, just makes complete sense to me. Um, my condition as a child was greatly affected um, by my uh, atopic condition and affected lots of really early aspects of my life. Um, from school, just really silly things like not being able to wear school uniform to school, having to wear my own clothes and that kind of covered dressings and things like that. Um, the most horrific um, Cub Scout camping trips with my father 
um, trying to pretend that I could sleep in a tent with all my friends, surrounded by all these allergens and those kinds of things. And uh, my wife's in the audience, she still tries to get me camping with the kids on various trips and still have slight mental block about that. Of course, friendships, um, and also even my dental care was affected um, my kind of care of my teeth and things like that at a very early age were affected by my medical condition. I guess that the seven year cycles, and I, I don't know where this is in current thinking, but in my thinking, um, eczema, asthma and allergies have always gone in those kind of seven year cycles and have changed every seven years. And that those seven year cycles have been very good to me. They changed dramatically when I was 14 and then when I was 21, and then you enter adulthood. And generally those conditions, I would say, are under control, but are still very much with me. And over that period of time, I've had some really good, like I was mentioning with Great Ormond Street. Um, I've written here bad. I wouldn't say any of the medical experiences were particularly bad, but perhaps just weren't so great or weren't quite so thoughtful in the way that I'd been treated and my family had been treated. Um, I should say I can't quite chase the generations back. I think Emma's quite good at chase, uh, tracing her generations back through her family. Um, for me, my father was a topic and he's the person I kind of hold uh, responsible for the condition. To be fair to him, um, uh, the way that he was treated with his eczema uh, was being tied up to his bed head um, to stop him scratching. So, I th again, I think that's a kind of really interesting thing. It's kind of holding our heads. Um, my children are atopic, um, I guess pretty unsurprisingly. Um, they predominantly have eczema and allergies. Um, we're very lucky that to date we don't have any asthma. They're aged 8 and 10. So we're, into, we're well into our first seven-year cycle. Um, my daughter has been on an immune suppressant drug um, for just over two years, coming up to three years. Um, again, very resonant to what you were saying from birth, um, she was highly affected by the environment around her. She was actually born at home. Um, but even with that kind of very strong family history and even personal experiences of her father, um, those first those first couple of years remained real challenge to us. Why wasn't she sleeping? Why was she red? Why wasn't she feeding properly? All those kinds of things. And you look back on it now, and as I say, even with our experience, it looks very, very obvious. But actually, we really, really struggled with her. And again, that goes through all factors of that early childhood. And for me, it's those things that for instance, she couldn't sit on the carpet at nursery or school um, at story time because she'd sit on the mat, all the other children would sit on the mat, all the allergens would come up from the carpet from everybody stomping around. She'd go red and sit there scratching and being very uncomfortable. So again, those kind of, um, those kind of experiences really stick with you and to try and work out how you deal with those. Um, again, uh, we kind of live by the spray emulence uh, for both children. So every morning and evening, they are sprayed down in almost like a, I was going to say like a spray tan, but the opposite of putting them in a kind of confined area and spraying them down to make sure that they've got that layer of protection on their skin. And we've done that from a very early, early age. Um, on, on the immune suppressant, my daughter looks really normal and really healthy, and since she's been on it, she lives a normal childhood. It's very interesting, though, that she's still affected. She's still affected by allergies, um, but she's still affected by her condition. And again, it becomes very difficult to get that across to the school, to her teachers, to, her, um, uh, to the people at school with her about her condition because on the face of it, she looks normal. I understand that there's a time limit to, to, as to when she can be on that drug. And that question about what happens when she comes off that drug. Um, it's also a drug that um, is still very much, I guess, in that kind of testing phase, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's unlicensed, yes. is that correct? Right. Yeah. yeah, so it's very kind of experimental. My son's a bit the opposite. 
he's not quite so badly affected as, my, as his younger sister, but actually because he's not on the immune suppressant, he looks worse. So he scratches a lot, he's affected by airborne allergens, um, and he really looks worse than my daughter, which is a really, again, a really kind of interesting um, uh, kind of equilibrium between the two of them. Uh, they both have allergies, egg, nut and dairy predominantly, um, and we fully put the, risk, the restaurant industry to the test. Um, I guess we want to kind of particularly big up Wagamama's, who of all the restaurant chains are really, really good with allergies and really, really proactive. But that's a really interesting, and I've run a restaurant myself as well, a catering operation. So it's really interesting how we respond um, to allergies in that way. Um, so in my professional life, I'm the chief executive of the Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill, um, a 1930s centre for the arts. Uh, we represent the visual arts and live performance and learning programmes. Um, the Delaware Pavilion was conceived by the very forward-looking Earl Delaware in the 30s and, interestingly enough, was part-funded by the Ministry of Health. So I don't know how many people know the pavilion. It's a very bold uh, spaceship of a building, 1930 spaceship of the building, that sits directly on the seafront in Bexhill-on-Sea. Um, it followed what was called the Kersall model, uh, which meant cure hall, so this was a, a concept, a Victorian Edwardian concept of mixing entertainment and civic space for public health, for social impact. Um, then followed the sanatorium model, uh, which if you look the, the kind of definition of that, an establishment for the medical treatment of people who are convalescing or have a chronic illness. So very much you would, uh, it's looking at mind, body and soul, you would sit behind the glass windows in the sunlight and take in the vitamin D, if it's not filtered out by the windows. Um, you would play physical games on the rooftop, courts, badminton, those kinds of games. You would read in the library and you would see a play or you would listen to the orchestra in the auditorium. We still deliver to the Earl's original vision and business plan today. I really love organisations. The pavilion was refurbished in 2005. We're now in 2017. I really love those organisations that you can go back to the original business model about social, cultural-led regeneration, um, creating civic space and looking at the social and civic impacts of that kind of architecture. And it's really, it's really interesting that we're in the arts, um, kind of arts and humanities area today, we're in Basil Spence buildings. Again, he was very interested in public space and civic space. Um, we deliver many free and inclusive programmes um, at the pavilion, um, and that really includes the ability to sit, contemplate, have a cup of tea and look out to sea. We've done lots of social impact studies about um, what the real value of that is. I guess for me, uh, the biggest impact um, in working at the Pavilion has been our relationship with Project Artwork, who's an arts-based charity in Hastings. Um, just, to, just to say, um, let, let me read some quotes. Um, they find out what somebody, somebody is capable of and to explore with them the possibilities of art through collaborations that foster choice, subject, subjective preference, intuition and non-verbal interaction. Their constituency is mainly individuals with con complex needs. So they have physical disabilities, mental, uh, visual impairment, etc., etc. They go on to say that in a, in a social and political landscape that is continually shifting, their work seeks to address areas of need as they occur. The artistic approach is as much about our ability and to our ability to affect positive change in society as it is to produce artwork. This is indefinitely interesting territory. It holds our attention and propels us continually to shape new approaches to art and collaboration. So to give you an example, um, I run a, a 500 square metre art gallery 
Um, we would show Anthony Gormley, we would show Andy Warhol, we would show Bridget Riley in that space. Through our partnership with Project Artworks, we decided to show the artwork of their participants. Really, really interesting project from a number of perspectives. A number of people saying to me the visual arts uh, community are very tight-knit, they have very strong opinions, with a number of individuals saying to me, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to show the work of disabled people, people with complex needs, in that very precious gallery space? My response to that is, why not? Why shouldn't we show that work? Actually, it's about giving those individuals the space to create work, to free their minds. And a lot of those individuals where they've been in home environments, where they've been very stressed, where they've almost been violent towards their families, actually in creating that space to make artwork. Again, it comes back to those social and civic spaces, gives that individual the room to breathe and to work out what those challenges are that they face. And I think this is very similar to the conversation that we're having. For me, I'm very worried about footfall, and we're very worried, worried about, um, as, a, as, a, as leading the organisation commercially, if we've just done Bridget Riley and the exhibition's had 60,000 visitors, uh, is this exhibition then going to attract 500 visitors? It's a bit like the question, who's going to turn up this morning? Who's interested? You know, it's really nice to see a really nice audience. What was really interesting about this exhibition was the huge numbers that came through. And it really did give Bridget Riley um, a run for her money in terms of the visitor flow, but also the secondary spend. So again, in order to satisfy a business model, what are those individuals spending in the cafe? Uh, what are they spending in the shop? Really, really interesting how that uh, developed, really. And really, really interesting how we're developing as an organisation of continuing to work with people with dementia, trying to give them time ongoing with people with complex needs, um, et cetera, et cetera, as an organisation. And I think this is really relevant as to how we look at a holistic and take slightly more of a breath. It goes back to when you go and see the GP and the GPs, we all know the GPs doing that. That actually, from my point of view, if we manage to have a conversation uh, for 10 or 15 minutes about what the wider issues are, not just... I've got a rash on my hands, here's some steroid creams, but actually what's causing those issues, then actually it would save us time and money in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Could I ask you, we will move on to Emma in two minutes, could I take this opportunity to ask you a question? Well, ask Stuart a question and, and perhaps also the entire audience, if you wouldn't mind. You have heard Stuart's story. And you have heard the story of Philagrin and how it might make a difference to the 15% who, who have the Philagrin gene defect. You, you know that we haven't been able, it will take us another 10 years, maybe 15, to do those randomized clinical trials to show whether or not intervening for a little baby. Imagine Stuart as a as a baby who's just been born. So here is his life starting off. How many of you feel it would have been a good idea for Stuart to know whether or not he had a filagrin gene defect, whether or not he had a problem which is going to lead to an increased pattern of allergen entry throughout his life, throughout the 46 years that he has lived and the 46 years that he's going to live. <laughs> How many of you think that is important? Stuart, do you think it, 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 would, it is important, it would have made a difference, or do you think you would rather not know? I, I think uh, intelligence in this area of atopy is, is lagging behind, really. And I think, as I, as I mentioned, even with my daughter, and even with the knowledge that we had, you're still kind of stumbling around in the dark slightly. And actually, I really think that the knowledge of how your genes are made up, what that background is, I think would be incredibly useful. Um, I know that 
within the field of cancer, for example, and we have um, we have a um, within the family we have um, issues with that kind of gene that causes cancer within the family, um, and I know that there's been that conversation of testing um, adults, female adults within the within our family, to look at breast cancer, lymph node cancer. Um, and whether that's kind of very proactive, so whether there's a problem, actually somebody has cancer, or there's a very high risk of somebody having cancer, that those individuals are, are tested and the appropriate action is taken, or there's the choice to take that action or not. And that's a real life situation within our family. I think actually having a child and not being aware of what's wrong with them or what could be wrong with them at a very early age uh, leaves you in the dark. That's my view. What does the house feel? Would you like to put your hands up if you feel that, yes, a baby with the kind of family history Stuart has just talked to us about should have this filagrin test, say if it costs about 10 or 15 pounds, ideally, under ideal circumstances. If you believe yes, please put your hands up. That's a question for what, why wouldn't you? Why because we, because well, for two reasons. First of all, it, it costs money. S secondly, we do not have the the randomised controlled trials that need to be done over a period of ten or fifteen years. We haven't actually people haven't probably even started doing those studies, which would give us the answers as to whether knowing would make a difference. So. My question really is, as a parent, if you imagine yourself as being a parent of a little child, do you feel that knowing does make a difference if it is going to, if there's a good chance that it's going to make a difference to your child, even if it hasn't been proved? Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I can't, am I, am I, I able to get... A scenario where knowing can have a negative effect. If, well, that's a very good point. Does knowing have, have a negative effect? Some people do argue. Yeah. Anxiety could be a, exactly. Yes. So if you know, and you know, you also can't think about it. That's worse than not knowing. Yes. Yeah, sometimes some people maybe that already experience anxiety. That's right. That's right. So that that could definitely have have a negative effect. So if somebody knew that he or she had a filaggrin gene defect early on in life, would that cause anxiety? Is that a is that why people would rather not have such tests? Or does the positive positivity of doing the tests balance it out? Anybody? Yes, please. Um, Prof, would it change the way that the child is cared for in the long term? Because, yeah, you might have the information, which is fantastic, but is there the capacity to actually treat them in the NHS? If you have that information earlier than, say, five or six when they come in with eczema? You could use emollients, which we know improves the skin barrier. But I can't tell you, we have the evidence to show that by using emollients, it will make a difference to someone like Stuart in 10 years' time. I don't have that evidence because I haven't been able to follow it up for 10 or 15 years. That'll, that is a very long-term study. But yes, there is the, the evidence on, on the surface that, that, that it does, uh, there is intelligent evidence that it does, that it's very likely to make a difference. I think there's something else, that's, again, from a more behavioural perspective. If you know that a medicine is personalised to, to steal genes, you may be more inclined to take it. And we know that there's a massive problem with non-adherence and asthma and eczema and things like that. And I, I do think from that perspective, and we're actually measuring this in one of the personalised medicine trials that we're looking at at the moment, whether personalisation actually improves beliefs about medicines and the efficacy of those medications. So I think you know, that is a hypothesis that, that may prove true as well. Thank you. Yes? So in this scenario, what, say if there was a test that you could do for £10, either the NHS support system or the favourite, to prove the phalanges things, and there was a... 
who would get access to that test? Would it just be, would it be all babies that get screened in their routine screening process? Or would it be um, at risk patients, for example, people with family histories of it? Or would you only do it if you are high risk, say, if your mum and dad had both been proven to also have that gene? Would it be cost effective to do it on all babies or just on high risk ones? Well, that's, that's a very good question. The cost effectivity has not, the cost effectiveness has not been worked out. Those are the studies that, that have not been done. So w one has to go by what seems rational. If you, if you feel that such tests can, should be introduced, sh should, be, should be provided to people, should be, people should have access to these tests, then, then one would have to say, I, I guess one would have to say, you have to provide these tests to people who are high risk, who, are, who have a strong, his, strong family history, and say to them, look, this test cost, costs... 10 pounds. The NHS cannot provide the test at this point in time. The NHS cannot provide it free. Would you like to have your child tested? And what do you think about that? Please. Yes. As a parent who just to my son's allergies with a very severe attack yes. at um, 11 months, old, um, what would you advise as a parent who is now to more at those early stages. Yes. It's the shock and the guilt of feeding your baby something that has this terrible effect on your supplements. Yes. Yes. So that's that's a very interesting important point. Please. I think it depends what the test is for because if it's something <coughs> where you can actually make a difference and treat it, then it's obviously helpful. But I know working in traditional therapy, we're getting lots of genetic work being kind of shown to us at the moment. And I get clients coming to me saying, well, I'd like a genetic test. And when I ask why, they say, for example, because there's a history of breast cancer. But it's a history of breast cancer. Yes, they might have a gene, but, you know, it's such a new field. We don't know what triggers that gene to actually activate it. Is there something they can really stick to about it? If it's outside, it's not the anxiety and stress is a big, big issue. So I think it does depend on what the condition is that's being tested for or what we can actually do to manage it once we know. We must move on, but 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 just just a just a quick point to to your point and to, and to Isabel's point as well. I suppose is should should people this is this is really my my question as a doctor. Should people have the choice to decide, or would you like the doctor to to decide, or even the the policy controlling? powers within the government to decide. What do people think about that? I mean, it depends who's funding it, because if it's NHS funded, then it would make sense for the doctors to only say, I feel like it'd be best if you had this treatment, in the same way any doctor would, like with chemotherapy, for example, because patients have the right to refuse treatment, but they don't have really the right to ask for treatment that's not necessary. But if it's a test that you could, say, pick up at the farm very easily, then it would be very good for um, parents to have the ability to make that decision. However, it also opens the other question of whether parents doing that to their child is just going to reinforce the anxiety problems, especially if the parent's already overly concerned with the child's health. Thank you. We will move on to Emma, and we'll come back to questions in the little while. We haven't got much time. Hello. Um, I'm Emma, um, and I'm going to bum you out this morning to start, you off, start the day quite easily. Today, six years ago, to this day, Hayden was in Brighton Hospital under cardiac arrest following a, a massive allergic reaction to a peanut that we knew nothing about, had no clue. He'd been asthmatic for five years before that, quite severely, in that hospital at Brighton. Um, no insight into the allergy side of it and as a parent at the time allergy to me was hay fever and it is a very naive view but a lot of parents still view it like that um, so I didn't know what I was seeing on the day but it was a normal day um, I, Hayden's got two other brothers and a sister so we got up in the morning and got ready for school um, and he had, sat down and had his breakfast Usual thing, cereal for breakfast, it was fine. It was my cereal that he wanted. No problem at all, mate, you had yourself. He sat and had it. 
20 minutes went by, I feel a bit sick, Mum. Well, first day back at school after the summer holidays, I'm not really going to jump to that. So we'll, we'll, we'll take you in and see how you feel when we get there. So we drove into, into school with his brother. He waved his brother goodbye. And by the time we got back home again, which is probably about a five-minute drive from school, he was in real trouble breathing with his asthma, so I thought. So we, walked back, we went back to the house. We did the usual. He has penicillin. He had his inhalers. We ran the hospital. The usual process that we'd done for five years beforehand. So we weren't stressed, we were just, oh well mate, this is typical, you know, just the first week back in school and we were back in hospital again. And then within 10 minutes he stood up to go to the back door to capture some more air and collapse with a cardiac arrest. And never really came back out of it. Um, we, the paramedics were wonderful and worked very hard on him. Um, and they managed to bring him to Brighton and then up to Thomas and Guy's in London. But unfortunately the brain swelling was too severe um, and we had to let him go. Now, this was something that was completely out of the blue to us. Was it, as a family, we've not had allergies as an issue before, ever. Asthma, yes. We are fifth generation asthmatics. Hayden was the sixth generation. So there's a long family history of it. But allergies, no. So this came out of nowhere for us. We had no treatments, no clue. So as parents, I was very angry with myself, with the world, with the health authority, with everybody. Why had my son not been picked up on this? Why had it not been seen? Well, the reason was we just didn't know. It wasn't, wasn't obvious enough then. We didn't know the link between asthma and allergies that we do now. Um, so from there on in, we opened a charity called Hayden's Wish. Um, and we, run, we raised funds mainly for Prof and his research. So hopefully one day find a test that will open the doors for parents like me. So we're not, we're not, in the, we're not blind. We're not walking into situations where we have no clue. We're not looking at a child going, it's an asthma attack and we'll deal with it like this. We're looking at it as it's a group of illnesses, so it could be part of all of it. And that's where I failed as a parent. So yeah, six years, six years today. So, so tomorrow I'll be going up to his grave and laying some flowers with his brothers and sister. And I'll have to talk to his sister about the allergies and the asthma because she also suffers with them as well. So she carries a bag with her with her EpiPens in and her asthma inhalers. And I have to work with the anxiety side of it and with the potential death side of it. And as a parent from both sides, I'd want to know. I'm sure you would too. But my daughter's growing up with that fear already inbuilt, and I can't hide that from her. Every day she sees a photo of her brother or we do something with a charity, it's there. And she asks me questions. She's seven years old, and she has an opinion on death which is extraordinary that he's just somewhere else. And that's fabulous. But for a seven-year-old to have to, to go through that and understand that, when we could prevent it and could have seen it coming, is uncomprehensible. So what I'd say to you is, as much as the anxiety side of it is a massive part, yes, the not knowing and the damage that can be left behind is even bigger. The charity, the, the charity work that we do, we educate as well. We do a lot of school visits around the senior schools and infants and junior schools to open children's eyes as well as parents' eyes to the allergies. And it's day-to-day -day living with it that we try to educate with. It's the fact that that child is walking around school and there are dangers around every single corner. A child opens a lunchbox and he's got peanut butter in it. It's gone. Yeah, my child sat down and had a bowl of cereal that had peanuts in it, crunching up cornflakes. That was it. That's what killed my child, crunching up, crunching up cornflakes. And that's the you've got a thing at the moment with planes and peanuts with that and people just do not understand this the gravity or the extent of the damage that can be done by something so simple like that so anything that can help us preempt this and prevent it in any way shape or form has got to be a good thing it's Short a really sleep. important part sorry, sorry it's a really important part of the debate and and some of you raised this and it is so so critical it is the anxiety raised by the testing and the anxiety of not knowing. I'm not saying that a particular test, a test on Hayden would have saved his life. I won't say that. But it, it is, and, it's, and I'm not going to think, we, we are not going to think back six years about Hayden. We are thinking of the thousands of Haydens around us the right future. now as we live. It is the anxiety of knowing 
and the anxiety of not knowing. And I don't know. Stuart, you want to say something? Well, I, I don't know quite what to say. Um, you know, I think we're, we're all really sorry for your loss. And, you know, perhaps it's a good thing that we're here today to kind of mark that anniversary, you know. It's the progress. We have to move forward. We have we have to, the more we progress, the more we look into the gene side of it, is the only way we're going to individualise the treatments. My child was, was treated exactly the same, the same drugs, the same treatments as, as my daughter is now. But they're completely different setups, they're completely different categories in terms of allergies and asthma. So, how can you treat them with the same medication when they're completely different characteristics? So I think we've got to look and go further into personal care. GPs struggle these days, doctors struggle these days to see patients um, for more than five, ten minutes at a time. When Back in the days, you'd, you'd go and see your doctor and you'd see the same doctor that saw your mother and your father and your grandparents. So he knew your family history. He could see the pattern. We're throwing our children at these doctors saying, it's, this has happened, that's happened, and giving them five minutes to look into it and go, that's, that's the issue. And we as parents are going around trusting that because they're doctors, that's what we do. And that's the difficulty, there isn't enough time and space for the doctors to treat, treat us and there's not enough time for parents to understand the issues or the complex disease conditions that we're dealing with. The, the trouble is we're still dealing with an area, I think a really good example, when my wife was pregnant with my, well with both children, is that kind of question, we discussed this before, was kind of going, I'm allergic to nuts, so don't, don't take nuts during pregnancy. I'm also anaphylactic to white fish, to cod and haddock and things like that. Come back from the health professionals, no, it's fine to eat fish. So if you're going to have an anaphylactic shock on nuts, but you're not on, I don't really understand that. There's also the argument about introducing those foodstuffs while you're pregnant so that you get that little drip feed and you get used to those things. But actually the information that, you know, actually the, the, G, the pressures on the GP's time just makes the GP's pretty useless, really. Once you hit the Alex and the Prof and his team, the level of care is really excellent. But it's those kind of bits in between, and from the school to the healthcare professionals to the GPs, particularly on allergies, the information and the clarity on information is very confusing. Mm. And as you say, when you, when you talk about anxiety, you know, actually that anxiety of going, <coughs> is there any member of our family that might be affected like Hayden? Um, or, you know, all the rest of your family that might be affected by Hayden. Um, it, it needs to be clearer as to how we navigate that landscape and how we improve, and I, you know, I made even a silly joke about restaurants earlier. But those restaurants that kind of give you, um, you know, it, it assure you that that the food that you're eating doesn't contain certain allergens, and then ten minutes later your child's been sick. You know, we still experience that. <coughs> so how do we actually start to work that through? I think the other really important question is just how much of the population is affected? Oh, it's it's massive amounts. I mean, this, this is an epidemic of this generation, certainly. Um, we're talking a good 30% increase in the past yes, so there's been 10 to 15 years. Um, and in terms of <clears throat> when you talk about the anxiety side of it, I look at my eldest child, who isn't on the allergic cycle, thank goodness, but his current partner is anaphylactic to, to shellfish. Now, with the mixture of our family history and now her family history, what's the hope for their future and their future children? Now, surely that's again, And how that's should we think about uh, to, you know, helping these families? Five minutes, I'm told. We must have an international. We must bring in our our excellent international perspective, because this is a problem. You know, we are here in the UK, and it's important that we are talking about this. Is this relevant? to the developing world. Minu Singh, Professor of Respiratory Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, Chandigarh, India. I'm really thankful to the British Science Festival for inviting me to speak on this important topic of personalized medicine. Every child is different. 
Personalized medicine means using information about genetic data of an individual in prediction, in diagnosis, in treatment, and in prognosticating the disease of a patient. We know that several diseases now have been identified which have a genetic basis. And it's important now to screen children for those genetic diseases right at the time of birth. And that would lead to earlier diagnosis in these children and then institution of therapy, which would help have better prognosis in the future. Moreover, in diagnosis of many of the rarer disorders, which initially we were not able to diagnose with the available information through Human Genome Project and the elucidation of genetic data of individuals, it's now become possible to diagnose many of these rare disorders. Now coming to personalized medicine, it is more towards treating a disease using genetic information. It is not akin to pharmaco uh, genomics, which means that you try to create drugs which would help correct some of the basic defects which these patients have. Just to give you an example, in cystic fibrosis, of which we in India do have a large number of patients and we've been one of the centers who reported this disorder for the first time in this country, we see now that uh, the children are uh, now, we are getting genetics elucidated in these patients and we find that Delta F508, which is otherwise the most common mutation of white people, is seen in only about 30 to 40 percent of cases. Now there are other mutations which have been detected in these patients and we now know that there are drugs which are available which can correct the basic defect of Delta F508 and many other mutations and we have uh, treatments which are available. Now some of these tre treatments are very very uh, expensive and uh, some of our patients can't afford them but still Having that diagnosis made gives them some hope that someday the treatment may become cheaper and they might be able to afford it and their the basic defect may get corrected. Similarly, in patients with asthma, we see that there is a mutation in the beta receptor gene by which the patients do not respond very well to the uh, beta-2 agonists or the long-acting beta-2 agonists which are given in the step 3 of therapy. That means the patients who do not respond to low to moderate doses of inhaled corticosteroids. And we see that many of these patients when they are given LABA or long-acting beta-2 agonists, they either become worse or they do not improve, necessitating further interventions. And sometimes people just go on increasing their medication and that may lead them into risk of toxic effects. Hence, it's become now important that if we detect this mutation or polymorphism in their gene in right in the beginning, and then we know that we do not need to give these patients these long acting beta 2 agonists because they will not improve after getting these medications and they may, might need some alternative approach. So, this is what is personalized medicine is doing to some of our patients who belong to respiratory diseases. Many times some other disorders also, because recently we had a patient who had biliary modeling on chest x-ray but also had uh, thyroid enlargement and then we found that this patient has papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. We know that this disorder also now is considered to be hereditary and there, is a, there are chances of some genes being present which may predict that whether the siblings of this patient have a chance of developing this cancer or not. So personally, there are several examples of uh, using genetic information for using medications and for predicting the response to treatment in these patients. But in countries like India, where treatment as such is expensive as far as because patients out of pocket expenditure on their treatments is enormous and uh, it's only in a few centers where treatment may be available to poor patients free of cost or an affordable kind of situation exists. So it becomes extremely important that we have some kind of public-private partnership of uh, 
agencies which are providing genetic diagnosis to these patients so that we can get these information on these patients and then we can design therapies related to the disease which this patient or the genetic basis of the disease which this patient is suffering from. Hence, uh, the main problem, the main limitation to this kind of approach or approach of personalized medicine in countries like India and other developing countries is the cost of getting the diagnosis done through genetic means. But we know now that the cost is now declining and some of the tests which were, which were costing like $1,000 earlier are uh, now we can um, do that in about $100 and so there is a decline in the cost and this would lead to uh, increased use of this modality of detection of genetic mutations and then designing a treatment related to that. So we see a lot of future to this kind of approach in our country and I would be happy to take any questions which are related to this particular problem in, uh, of personalized medicine because we know that every child, although their genome may be similar, but there are chances that there will be minor variations in their DNA which makes every child different from each other. Thank you very much. She can't take any questions. <laughs> Sorry. Do, do you have uh, any questions, please? Any further questions? Yes, thank you. So do you test children, say, that do have asthma, just as standard allergy tests, nothing to do with genetics, but um, <coughs> this, this is a subject of interesting debate. I, I have, because you're right, personalized medicine is not just about genetic testing. It is about taking an individualized approach to medicine and we are we have had I'm working closely with the Royal College of General Practitioners to try and encourage GPs to do more allergy testing out in the community it is in a state of flux it is being strongly encouraged I think yes yes and we are trying to increase we are trying to increase the awareness of the general practitioner committee community around this particular line of thinking one more question, anyone? <laughs> Any burning questions? If not, thank you very much for coming. This has been a splendid session, a wonderful starting point, I think. Would, would you agree, Emma? Yes. Thank you. It's been really, really interesting, wonderful hour, and I'm sure we will not stop here. Thank you very much.